Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Alex Dotskowski and I love C++. I'm starting this talk like it's an AA meeting, but hey, you all came to C++ conference, so it's your problem. Um, I love researching new features of C++ and actually my workplace allows me to do that all the time. I'm working on an exciting startup called Speed Data and we are developing the next big thing in big data. We're going to accelerate big data queries. Uh, we are using C++ 17, we are starting to using C++ 20, and we are using a lot of metaprogramming. So we are using all those features that I'm going to show today and many, many more. So we are hiring. After the meeting, if you want to come, come and talk to me about the positions. Let's start. Multiple namespaces. In the dark ages before C++17, when you wanted to define multiple namespace, you had to do something like that. So it looks like an arrow shape, and it's not that bad, but if you have many more, it will look bad in the end. Some people are trying to do it in the same hierarchy level, but it still looks bad. With C++17, you can do just this. One namespace, one line, and you define the same thing exactly. So it's much more readable and without the arrow shapes and everything else. Structural bindings. I think this is one of the most important features that entered C++17, and I will explain why. In C++11 or C++14, we could create a function that will return a tuple, but to use the tuple, we had to extract it. So we could extract just the tuple itself, then use get with the numbers, or we could use tie, as you can see here. Uh, this is not that problematic, but why should we do that? If we already have tuples and we already know how something will work, why can't we just use that knowledge? In C++17, we can actually do this. Structural binding is saying that we can define those variables in the same line we're using the function. We're using the same function that returns tuple of vector, boolean, and number of points, which is, which is an integer, and it will just unpack it for you in the same time. Few things that you need to know about this, it works very good for tuples. For some reason, for uh, pairs, it lacks a little bit. So if you will look at the uh, um, disassembly of this code, for pairs, it has more assembly lines. Here are some, uh, some examples of what else you can do with structural binding. It's not only tuples, it can unpack arrays as well. Here you see an array of four integers, and we are unpacking it in one line to, to variables. We can do the same thing without copying the variables, and that's made with auto-reference. So we can do anything we want with this and just print whatever we want. Data members can be unpacked as well. So as you can see here, if you have a struct, which is a, data, which is a data class, you can unpack it as well. In the same way, you're unpacking it with auto, the variables, and the assignment itself. This is a more complex example when you can see that we have a, an ordered map of car parts, and we want to run all over the car parts and use key and value. So does it remind something from a different language? It is Python. Uh, init if and the switch statement. In C++ 14 or before C++ 17 to init something, if we had the same map of uh, car parts and we wanted to find something in the, uh, in the map of car parts, we had to do something like that. We would like to find a door then we would ask if the door is not the end of the, the map. And then we will say, okay, if we found the door, let's put the second element, the count of the doors that we have, to 10. But then we wanted to find bolts as well. So we will define found bolts. We will do the same thing all over again. It's a little bit messy because you are using many variables that you don't actually need afterwards. That you don't actually need afterwards. And, uh, you may be attempted to use something like this and just use found part 
inside scoped, var uh, scoped code, it will work. It will uh, erase the found part because it's out of the scope. It will delete it, but still the code looks bad. In C++17, we got something that's called init, uh, init if and switches. So you can actually initialize values inside if and, uh, and the switches. Here you can see I'm doing the same thing. I'm finding the part inside the if, it's inside the if itself, and then I'm asking the question about the final parts. This thing, the iterator that was returned, will be available only inside the if. So you don't need to do anything else to delete it. And then we can ask the same thing about the second card parts, just with ifs. So the code gets cleaner and more readable. And here is an example with structural binding and initialize if. So you cannot initialize more than one value inside in the if. If you want to do that, you can do this simple trick. You are using, uh, you are using bindings to do the same thing. If you remember correctly, car parts in place will emplace it inside the map. When you're, uh, when you're calling to emplace, it will return a, a, a tuple of two pair, a pair of two things. It will return the iterator to the place where we emplaced it, and we will return a Boolean. So here you can see that we are getting the iterator, and if it was inserted, then we are asking if it was inserted, we are doing something to it. Const expression if. Here we are getting a little bit into metaprogramming, but it's still very useful to people. Let's look at the next function. We have, we have. Which one? This one. Why do you think so? Uh, like maybe. I don't think so because, in the end, this is a very simple, uh, simple example. But if you have something else that is more complex, you will want those things to be available only inside the if scope. And uh, par iterator and inserted may be not used after the if. So why do you want to keep those variables? Here is, again, it's very simple and I'm not actually, I'm using the inserted only inside the if and then I'm using the iterator. But maybe I want to do something else. Maybe you have a tuple that does something else. Car parts is the map, right? Is the map, yes. So, uh, yes. Are there also available in the else? Um, if I remember correctly, yes. No, they are not, sorry. Const expression if. Um, here, let's look at the template function that returns auto. Since C14, you can return auto something, and it will deduct the type by itself. And we will be attempted to do something like this. If the template parameter that we pass to the function is a pointer, then we will return a reference to the pointer. If it's not a pointer and it's a value, we will just want to return the value. What will happen here? Will it compile? The answer is no. It will not compile because the, the compiler cannot deduce what you really want it to do. Will it return just a value? Is it a pointer? What should I do with it? The answer, is in, in C++, the answer from C17 is the next one. You can use const expression inside the if itself. And here you are asking, const in, during the compile time, you are telling the compiler, if you will find that the template uh, type parameter that you receive is of type that is a pointer, then I want this function to be just the reference in the pointer. And this, the else part, will be cut out from the function in compile time. So it always knows what you want from it. Yes? On the method, no, it won't. Inline members. This is something very simple, but it still helps. So if you remember, since uh, C++11, you could do something like const static const expression something equals something. You can initialize these uh, members inside the class. You don't need to initialize them outside the class. 
In C++, but those things have to be const. In C++17, they have allowed something like this. You can use inline, started int, x, y, z equals 100. So those things became something that you don't have to be in const expression. They don't have to be const afterwards. It helps. Useful attributes. Some attributes, like uh, from, the uh, from the previous talk, we talked about likely, unlikely. Sadly, those things were added only in C++20. But here, I want to show you two of those, uh, of those attributes that were added in C++17. Maybe unused. You can put maybe unused on, uh, you can put maybe unused on return types or on uh, parameters to the function itself. If maybe unused was, uh, was used, then the compiler will not warn you that this parameter is not used inside the function. Uh, how we used to do it is just marking out the parameter, just saying we want int, or using some Qt function that will ignore this parameter, or doing something with it just for the compiler to shut up. Here we don't have to do that. We just can write the function as is and just use them. About the return type, here we are saying, okay, this function returns something, but don't worry about it. Sometimes maybe I don't need to use this variable that will be returned from it. It helps again because the compiler will not yell because it's, uh, you're telling him, I know what I'm doing. Yes. With overrides, it, with overrides, it's a little bit problematic, and I just don't want to get to it because I don't have a lot of time. But it's more complex when you want to override a function. Uh, here's another one that's called the uh, no discard. So no discard is the opposite of the previous one. Here we are saying, if we have no discard here, this return value will always have to be used, and this warning will become an error, an actual error, and you won't be able to compile the function. Evaluation order. So let's talk about this. This is one of the, I think, the best things that were added to C17. Let's look at the next function. We have a struct that has a function and two uh, members. We have a function that receives unique pointer of my struct and an integer. Then we have another, uh, have another function that receives just an integer and adds one to it. Then we want to use it like this. We want to say unique pointer, my struct, new struct, and add one. What, what may happen here? What may happen here? The problem is that nothing is guaranteed to us in C++. Uh, the parameter evaluation uh, is not guaranteed to us. So it may start with add, and then it may jump to, new, uh, to the unique pointer. It has to evaluate the new, and then it has to evaluate the unique pointer. In that case, it's fine. But what will happen, for example, if inside add, it wasn't just a simple function that does nothing, and it could throw an exception. So what might have happened? It might have initialized the new, then you have a new memory on the heap. Then it might call the add function itself. The add function throws. We are running out of scope. And then the new that was used will never be deleted. And we have a leakage. You will, and now I want to show you how we could fix it in C14. In C14, make unique was added. And everybody was, was telling me, well, it's just something that is uh, sugar, um, synthetic sugar. It does nothing. It's the same. Well, no, it's not the same. Because in this case, make unique have to be completed, uh, completely evaluated before it continues. So nothing, it doesn't matter what happens here inside the function. It will always evaluate this or this and then evaluate the unique pointer itself. So it will always be deleted. In C17, it gets even better. You can use the same code that we saw in the first example, and it will finish. It means that the evaluation order must be strict now. If it starts with the first parameter, it has to finish the whole evaluation for the first parameter. 
If it starts from the second, it will have to finish in the second parameter, and then go to the first, etc. cetera. Uh, I have added a link to, to the standard itself that explains all those these things, and I have a brief summary that shows how those things work. So I just want to say that those things will evaluate from A to B to C to D, and that's how it works. For example, here we look at A dot B, so A has to be eval evaluated first, then we will evaluate B. Inside the function, we have A, B1, B2, B3, because it still can call any of those Bs in any order that it wants, but it has to complete them. I really suggest you reading the article about this. Yes. And start with B. Yes. If it has two evaluations inside it, like you saw before, it has new, and then you are calling function that call. Yeah. And this occurs even in single thread. Yes. Because there is no guarantees until C17 what would happen. It can do everything it wants. There was not, nothing in the standard about it. For example, if even context disappears, it will continue. The Doesn't matter. It will try, if it occurs during the evaluation, it will continue with the evaluation it started. But then it can do whatever it wants. So you need one more execution thread in order no. to start B? No. Before finishing A? No, but you started the new. The new has finished. Then it jumped to B. And you have still something to do with the unique pointer that it have, hasn't finished before that. It's a different evaluation. You have to understand it's not the same function. New is a function. And then the unique pointer is a function. The unique pointer is according to the constructor. Yes, and it's a function. It's a function. So before finishing it, it can start with B. Yes. Fun. C++ is fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's a compiler optimization. The compiler would think it can be better to, to run it like this. It, it has nothing to say. The standard said nothing about the strict ordering. It has no strict ordering, so it could do anything it wants. Now the standard states what it's supposed to do, and it will do it. Auto in templates. So in C++11, if you wanted to, um, I will start again. Auto is something that you can pass to a template now, and it will evaluate by itself what's the type, and you can pass values to the, point, to the template itself. Um, if you would look at C++11, if you wanted to do something like this, if you wanted to uh, assign, uh, create a new type that's called in constant 42, we have to create a template that receives a type, then create a type, from, uh, and then pass a value from the type, pass a value from the type, and then we can just create it with int and 42. With C++ 11, uh, 17, we don't have to do that because we have auto. So here we are passing one auto value into the template. It already knows what type it is. It evaluates it, and it knows that it is an integer and 42. If I would pass something that it's double, it would know that it's a double, etc. Here is another example which is a little bit more confusing. If you want to create a heterogeneous list of things, so with C++17, it's got a little bit easier because you can say auto, ellipsis, vs. That means that it's variadic parameter of autos, and it will auto, it will auto um, assume what it will receive. And here we can pass to it 42x, which is each character, and 13u, it's unsigned int. And it will just create the list for you. If you want to do something that is heterogeneous, it has to be from the same type, so can, you can use auto for the type. It will deduce the type itself. Then you can use decal type, which will say, okay, I got a type from something. Now I can decal type it and understand what type it was. And I want a variadic list of the only those types. And here we, are st uh, we can init it only with one, two, and three. We cannot do the same thing as we've done before. Fold expressions. We talked about variadic templates in the previous uh, slides. So before C17, 
you wanted, if you wanted to use a variadic template, you had to use recursion on it, variadic recursion. It works, but it's a little bit messy, and you have to create many, many new functions for it to pass into the recursion. You have to stop the recursion. And we want to do something that's a little bit simpler, and we want to use these values. So to make things simpler, we could do something like this in C++14. In C++14, we may use this. I, I think it's a very, one of the stinkiest tricks in C++. We're using an initialization list of integers, we are creating res that we created before, we are multiplying it with t, then we are using comma. What comma does in C++, it's everything that was evaluated before the comma is okay, but the initialization list will get only the zero, what is after the comma. Because of that, it's just integers, and then we are unpacking it. So it will just do a multiplication of all the values that it received. I don't know about you, not a lot of people can read this. Uh, in C++17, you can do the same thing. Here we have the function that does the multiplication, as we saw before, but this multiplication is done like this. It passes the variables, it passes the parameters, and then it just uses t multiply ellipsis. That's it. One line does everything. Here are more examples. Average. You can do the same thing, you're adding up, summing up all the variables that you receive, and then you are unpacking. You can ask the size of ellipsis t. It knows to say how much variables were received by the variadic pack. Here's a function that does something. It just add things and then add, fives, add, add five to the answer. Here we have a function that receives functions and adds up all the return values from the function. Here we have something that receives auto of numbers and uh, another auto of x and then creates a common type, sums them up and adds, adds x to them. We can do everything we want. Just, in, uh, just a small note, I had to use C++20 for that, so excuse me everyone. Uh, we will pass this. We can do a lot of things very quick and very easy, in my opinion. A class te a template argument type deduction. So in C++ 11, 14, to create a tuple or something that uses a templated uh, arguments or templated values, we had to do something like this. For example, if we have a tuple, then we would create something like int float double and then we will have to initiate it. Or we can do something a little bit more, be uh, something better, and use a helper function. So we are using make tuple here. Make tuple will just receive those arguments, parameters, sorry, and it will deduce them because it is using variadic pack. And it will create this tuple for you. But in C17, we can do something that is clearer, and we can just say std tuple. 1, 1F, one 1, or 1, 2, hello, and it will deduce it by themselves and create the correct type for you. So basically, if you are creating those tuples and then you are uh, trying to say, see if they are equal, of course they will not be equal because they are different types and different tuples. Deduction guidelines. Those amazing things that were added in C++17 for those STD uh, tuples and other uh, vectors and everything else, uh, collections, sorry, it's, it is available because they added something that's called deduction guidelines. And the best thing that they have done is they gave the user the ability to add those deduction guidelines by themselves. So what will happen if you do something like that in C++17? We are creating a std function that receiving the function, the free function that we are created here. It will work. Good news. std already done the work for us. Uh, but if we will want something like this, if we have a class and it has a member function inside it, and we are attempting to do the same thing, it will not work because they haven't added that. It's an easy fix. So we can add, uh, inside STD, we can add 
those two things, those two template deduction guidelines that are basically saying to the compiler, hey, look, if you are seeing a function, that be it called with a function with a variadic argument list, then you, can sh you just need to call a class that calls function with those parameters. And the same thing goes for the const. Just add const to it. So now it will work. We have, uh, we have the, the member function that we used before. We have two free functions. And we can use them like this. Function one, function two. Now we can call my class function, and it will work as well. One thing that you have to remember is member function have states, because they are part of an object. So if you want to call func tree that contains the member, the member function itself, you have to pass the correct object that you want to work on. And here you can see I'm passing C and the parameters to the function. Variant. Variant is a type safe union that we used in C. The problem with unions is they're unsafe. You can do many hacks with them, you can do many undefined behavior with them, and they're basically not good to use, but people still tend to use them even after we have those variants. Uh, just a quick example, we, here we have a variant of integer and float, and we are creating v and w, and they are the variants of integer or float. v will receive an integer, then we can extract it with get, like we used to extract things from tuples, and we are saying, okay, I want something from this variant, and I want it to be an integer. I can do the same thing for w, and I'm just extracting the integer from it, and it will be set into the variant, the other variant. And I can use get zero, because those variadic pack here, they are considered as zero, one, two, three, or you can actually call the type that you want. Um, bad variant access. If you are trying to access a variant that you have created, and this variant is not correct, then it will throw. So it will throw something that's called bad variant access. Here, for example, we have v that is initiated with int, and we are trying to get string from it, and it will just say it's bad variant. You are not correct, and you can catch it. Here's another example of uh, how we can use variants with visitors. So variants, you can have a vector of variants, and the vector of variants may contain different types, each one of those. You can create a visitor that will receive a function, and it will do something on those variants according to the type that they have inside them. Here is a very simple example of you are getting auto R value references to all the variables into it, and then you just want to print them. If you want to do something more complex and, um, and exciting, uh, I have bonus uh, slides that are explaining about lambda inheritance, but I don't know if we will get to that. Why the right value references? Sorry? Why the right value references? It's not right. It's used with auto. When it's in auto, it's universal reference. It will deduce by itself if it's L value or R value reference. Optional. The, class temp uh, the, the optional class template is saying that maybe we, will have a var uh, maybe we will have something initialized inside this class, or maybe it won't have something inside it at all. It is used like this. For example, you have a function that returns something. Until now, you had to, if you want to do something like that, you had to return null, or something that you may ask, is it something that I want? or maybe it's an error, or throw an, exam, an exception, that's a problem. Now you don't have it. You can have a function that returns something that is optional. It may be something that is not initialized at all, and we are passing a Boolean to it. If this Boolean is correct, then we will return harmony. If it's not correct, we will return empty brackets, and it will be just an empty optional. And this is how we use it. We are passing true to value or, empty, when you're passing something to value or it says, if it has no value, if it's empty, then please print this default value. If it has something, don't print it. As you can see, in the first line we are getting harmony, and in the second line we are getting empty, as expected. 
uh, null opt. It's the same way as using the, the empty brackets, but it's a little bit more um, aligned with everything else that we know about C++. So we want to return something that is std null pointer for pointers. And here for optional, we have std null opt. It's the same way as before. We are asking about B. We are returning harmony or we are returning nothing. And it works the same way. Any. Any is just a way to say void pointer, but in a safe way. Any can be anything you want. As you can see, it can be an integer, it can be 314, it can be true, it can be a string. But to use any, you need to use any cast. So how do you use any cast? You're just casting to what you want. The problem, not the problem, the good thing is if you're casting to something that it doesn't hold, it will throw an exception. String view. String views are references like a window to look at a string. You are not actually owning the string, you are just passing a reference to it. So one thing to remember about them that if you are using them, don't let the actual string get out of the scope because if it will get out of the scope, you will get a dangling reference to it. Why should we use string? Why, what is wrong with strings themselves? Strings are nice, but the problem with string is each string that you are creating is using an, a buffer inside them. This buffer needs to be allocated. Sometimes they are allocated on the stack. Sometimes those buffers will be allocated on the heap. In any case, often you don't want to use it and you want to save allocations and do less for, uh, for better runtimes. Let's look at the next example. Here I'm, I'm overall overriding a new, a new function, and every time that new will be called, I will print out how many, how many bytes I'm allocating right now. Then I have a function that receives two strings that they are compares, and they are using string reference, not strings themselves. But still, if we are creating a string that's called turn around, and then we are creating strings every now and then I feel a little bit lonely, and then every now and then I feel a little bit tired, and turn around my child, we will look at the output of these things, and then we are allocating 41 bytes for the first string, then we are allocating 63 bytes for the second string. It doesn't matter that it is reference to a string, it wasn't a string, so you need to create a string for it to work. Then we are saying, okay, they are not the same, then we are allocating 66 bytes for the uh, second string, for the third string, sorry, and then we are allocating 45 bytes for the third string. Possible solutions are using a char pointer, but then we are messing up with the string because when we are using a string view or string, we have all the functionality that we have from strings. Uh, and what will happen if you need char pointer and then Q string? or then anything else that you would like to use, you might have something like this. This is a mess. And I don't know, but it makes me sad. Um, the real solution is string view. So we have the same functionality as before, but we are passing string views inside the compare function, not strings. Now, it is much better. We're just allocating 41 bytes for the first string because it is an actual string. Everything else is for free. Another thing, another benefit that we get from using uh, string views is if you have a string and we want to use a substring from it, we can derive it exactly from the string with fight first at, and it will actually give you the answer that you're looking for without allocating a new string. Because if you are doing it on a regular string, even this function will create another allocation. And as you can see here, it just allocated 39 bytes for the first string, and that's it. Extract. Before C++ 17, if you wanted to change a key from a map, you had to extract the iterator to the key, move it from the map, delete it from the map, and then create a new thing inside the map, a new pair of key value inside the map, because keys are constant. And that's exactly what I'm trying to show here. We have a fruit map of fruits, 
and we want to extract Apple and change the key. We cannot do that. With C++17, with C++17, we can use extract. What extract is doing is basically extracting the pair from the map. It deletes it in the map. Then you can actually, uh, it's not constant anymore. And you can do, and you can, sorry, it's, it's before C++. We can do something like that. It is moving the, uh, the value from the pair that we found. We are erasing it from the map. And then we are locating a new pair inside the map. With extract, we are just extracting it from the map. We have the access to it, and we can actually change the key right now because it's not part of the map and it's not constant anymore. And then we can just move it back to the map itself. So we are passing, so we are passing, saving one allocation here. It's pretty good. Uh, because the keys are stored outside of map out, so how they are sorted? It defines, it, it, it may, it, if it's a map, then it's sorted. If it's an unordered map, then it's not sorted. But in any case, when you're extracting something from this, even in an in unordered map, the first key, the key itself, it's constant. It's still constant. If you are wanting to insert something into a sorted map, it will just use log n algorithm, it will run on the tree, and then it will insert it in the correct location. It will not be in the same location as before, but it will be still sorted. So in this way, you are just changing the key. I don't see that you are inserting the key once again. Here. Here. I have created, I have extracted it from the map, I have changed the key, ah. and I'm inserting it again. I'm inserting it once again. Mm -hmm. Merge. Merge is a simple way. Yes. Regarding the system. So it would work also, also for extract, right? Because even in the yes. set, you could not change anything because the key and the value is the same thing and now you change it. It will be hacking if it's a set. If it's a map, it's a little bit more complex. Uh, it's something that you can do. If it's a set, why would you extract something, then change it, then add it? Just delete it and add what you want. Merge. In C17, they have added a nice library function that can merge sets, maps, etc. Here we have three maps, and we want to create one map from it. So all we have to do is merge one to the, to the other, and then merge the third one into the first one we have created. Pretty easy. If it's, a, if it's a single map, then it will just not insert it. It doesn't throw an error. It just, uh, it's trying to add everything it can. And even if you are trying to add something into a map, into a sorted map, if you have the same key already inside it, it will not throw an error. It will just say it's not inserted. You have the iterator and the boolean that we spoke before. PMR. PMR is one of the more interesting things that were added in C17. It's a polymorphic way to write allocators. So until now, until C17, it was very hard to write allocators, and it was a lot of work, tedious work, a lot of boilerplate code, and that's why people don't, doesn't do that. But with <laughs> memory resource, you have this, and it's polymorphic. When I say polymorphic, it depends on the memory resource that you pass to it. So if you pass something that's on a stack, it will use something on the stack. If you pass something on a heap, it will try to do something on the heap. It has already predefined types for you. For example, synchronized pool resource. If you want to use the same pool, memory pool for many threads, it will synchronize that pool for you. You don't have to do that anymore. If you want to use multiple threads, but you're saying, OK, I don't have need synchronization for them because I know what I'm doing, you have unsynchronized pool for that as well. It will be faster. And we have monotonic buffer resource. Monotonic buffer resource is the basic thing. It is just assigning a buffer wherever you want with the values you want, and it will use it for the allocation itself. 
we, they already predefined some of the collections that we know in C17, so we can already use polymorphic collection. For example, we have vector, we have string, we have map, and many, many more. Here's an example. In this example, I am creating a very small buffer of characters on the stack. I'm filling it with ease, and then I'm printing out the buffer itself. Then I'm creating a monotonic buffer resource, which just will create an allocator, a memory resource for the polymorphic allocator to use. This resource is the buffer that we created before, so it will be on the stack. Then we are creating a vector, PMR vector, of course, of the memory resource. When you are passing the memory resource to it, you are saying, OK, this is your allocator. Please use this one, and not the, the, the regular one that uses new. And then we are filling it up with A to E, small A to E's. Then printing the buffer itself again. What we will get is E, empty slots, 20 empty slots, then we're getting A, A, B, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, E. What happened here? Why are we getting all these reputations? The vector had to grow. And when it grows, it needs to copy its memory to a different location. Because the different location is inside the buffer, you're just seeing this being multiplied over and over again. What can we do about it? Pretty easy. We can use reserve. We can do the same thing but we have added reserve 20 slots here. That means that the vector doesn't have to grow anymore because it's already have the 20 characters that it can say. And as you can see, it's not copying anymore. It's just using A, B, C, D, E. A very interesting way to use poly polymorphism resource allocators is using a collection of polymorphic objects. Why is it interesting? Because Polymorphic objects, polymorphic uh, allocators are local. Locality means the child inside the, the collection will ask the father for memory. And if the father doesn't have memory anymore, then it will use something else, maybe a father of a father, or maybe it will fall back, uh, fall back again to new. Here I want to show you a little example that uses strings polymorphic strings and polymorphic vectors. So here we are just printing the characters inside the, say, the, side, the buffer itself. We are creating a memory resource of 256 characters, a little bit bigger than before. Then we are placing two strings, not too big strings. Then we are printing the buffer. Then we are placing a very, very long string inside the buffer, uh, inside the vector, printing it. And then we are placing and then we're in placing one, two, three, four, which is again a small string. So what will happen here? Let's look at the memory. The empty buffer just prints empty slots. When you have two strings inside these slots, we're printing them inside the memory of the buffer itself. So the PMR strings ask the collection, please give us memory, and they received it. Then when we are using the, the longer string, it cannot be stored inside the memory itself. It, it, it doesn't use the small string optimization, and then it has to allocate the memory. But still, when it allocates the memory, it still uses the same buffer. So here you can see the longer string is in the end of the buffer because it's allocated a new space for it. It's not in the beginning like the other ones, it's in the end. Now, if we are using again one, two, three, which is a small string again, it will appear here. So it's again in the beginning of the buffer. Now, what will happen if we will use regular strings, not PMR strings? One thing that I have to mention that PMR strings are a little bit bigger in size than regular strings because you have a state to manage. In regular string, you don't have a state of the size and the allocator. Here you do have that, uh, sorry, here you don't have that because those are regular strings. We are doing the same thing. So we are printing hello darkness, my old friend, and then there is nothing. And then we are printing hello darkness, my old friend, and the big string is not here. Why it's not here? Because it's had to allocate on the heap. Then we are adding one to three. As, as you can see, 
It works here as well. We have Hello Darkness, My Old Friend, 1, 2, 3, 4, everything's fine, but you will never see the big string because it's on the hip. Some things that didn't make the cut, file system. It's a big feature that, uh, that made a lot of lives easier because we can actually use file system like in any other uh, uh, programming language. Common type. It's something that gives you the ability to say, OK, you have variadic template arguments, and I want just the common type of all these arguments. Conjunction, disjection, and negation. Again, for variadic things, you are saying conjunction is an and between all of them. Disjoint is an or between all of them. And negation is just negate everything. Lambda inheritance. I think lambda inheritance is one of the more more exciting things, because you can do a lot of things with lambda inheritance, and you would have to remember in your head that lambdas are just classes, and classes can be inherited from. And be inherited from means that you can manipulate them. Apply, that means that if you are passing a function and a tuple to it, it will extract things from the tuple and pass it to the function for you, so you don't have to write the code all over again, and you don't have boilerplate codes. Invoke. It's a standard way to invoke anything you want. You can invoke a member function, you can invoke a variable, you can invoke a function pointer. Everything is invoked the same way in C17. And many, many more that didn't make the cut. Questions? Okay, thank you for listening. As I mentioned before, I'm looking for people, very good people, that want to work in an environment with a lot of C++, with amazing things that we are doing and we are developing. So if you want to come and talk to me after this, please do. Thank you again. <laughs>